enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Yeah. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Today we're going to be talking about building services in Go. Um, definitely, if you want to follow along, please have a copy of this or a check out of this repository. Alternately, I also have it on a USB stick if your internet's not working or whatever. Um, we will be compiling stuff as we go. It's definitely designed to be a hands-on tutorial. So you ideally also have a working installation of Go. If you don't, it's also available on a USB stick. So, all right. Um, today, or I'll start with a bit about who I am, what, I'm, what I do. I'm Mark. I work at Dropbox, uh, do site reliability engineering, have for the past 10, 12 years at various places. Um, by night, I contribute to Dream with Studios, an open source, Perl-based fork of LiveJournal, uh, kind of a blogging, social network sort of website. Um, and here's my GitHub, Twitter, email, etc. It'll be repeated at the end, but feel free to contact me. So what are we going to do today for the next hour and a half or so? We're going to start with talking a bit about services and what I define as a service and what I mean when I say building services in Go. We'll do a kind of a brief history or talking about the, the architecture of services over the past 10 years since I've been working in this field. We'll talk a bit about Go and why I think it's actually a good choice for building services. And then we'll spend the bulk of today's time on our tutorial program. And then we'll do wrap up. So I'll start with the caveat lector. This is not strictly an intro to Go tutorial. Um, this tutorial is designed for the level of people who have done some Go and sort of like probably have done the tutorials, have read through maybe a blog post or two, have written Hello World, and have a basic understanding. Um, but it's, not, it's also not the advanced guru level. So if you're coming here expecting like the really deep into the garbage collector and how all these work, um, I don't know that depth, so we won't go too far into it. Ideally, this tutorial will be in the intermediate where you come in, you have a little knowledge, and you walk out with more knowledge. Um, there's going to be a lot of code, but a tutorial will be going through it. So please ask questions. I want you to come out of this knowing the stuff, knowing the material, and knowing what we're talking about. So questions are very welcome. And I build time into the tutorial for questions. So please feel free. So we're going to start by talking about services. Um, and I failed completely at animation, so I have three slides that say services. So service design over the past 10 years has actually changed quite a bit. Uh, if you look at any architecture or application from a decade ago, you probably find a one large monolithic application. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically, so my background is in sort of like the Googles and Mozilla's of the world, not so much like the enterprise companies. I don't know a lot about how they've been doing things. Uh, they've actually been doing sort of service-oriented architecture a, a lot earlier than a lot of the more internet companies. Um, but older sites are often large monolithic applications. LiveJournal slash DreamWit certainly is. One large mod Perl app. That's hundreds of thousands of lines of code or even millions at this point. A Dropbox was uh, one large application. It's actually, at this point, we've been pulling things out of it. Um, to make them smaller. The problem with this design, the problem with building an application that is one huge mess of code, is fairly obvious to most, most of us, but they're very complex. They become impossible to extend, impossible to work with. Um, they're filled with dark little edge cases where the edge cases have edge cases. And when you hire someone new and they want to, oh, I'll just improve this little thing, you have a lot of, well, that's going to change this, that's going to break that. Institutionalized knowledge becomes a big problem it becomes really hard to continue growing these applications. So a buzzword that you'll probably hear thrown around a lot is service-oriented architecture. And if you think about it, it's very close to sort of the Unix philosophy. Um, if, you're, if you've done a lot with Unix command lines, you know, you've got your little commands that do one thing and do it fairly well, and you chain them together to get more complex behaviors. If you want to think about service-oriented architecture, or SOA, that's roughly the concept that we go with small, well-scoped services that are easy to think about. So it's the difference between I have my website and I run my website and I have a search service, I have a payment service, I have you know, whatever other services that you run. So why 
SOA, as mentioned, largely, for me, it's a way of managing complexity. It's a way of keeping the scope sane. If you have a narrow specification, it's much easier to build. So if you think about this sort of logically, if I say, okay, we're going to build a chair, you can probably envision how to build a chair. You probably can think what pieces it's going to need. Even if it's a fancy chair, like a folding chair, you can probably picture that and draw it out. And I think probably we could trust anybody in this room to build a chair. That's pretty straightforward. On the other hand, if we want to build another Auckland Harbor Bridge, I don't know if anyone in this room could actually do that. Unless you're a civil engineer, in which case, fantastic. But I certainly couldn't. Bigger projects have much more complexity and scope built in. Smaller services, um, as we call them, or smaller projects, are also much more easy to monitor and reason about. It's easy to ask the question, is my search service down? Is my search broken? Than it is to say, you know, is my website working? I, I'm not even sure what that question really means. Um, if you read the Wikipedia article on service-oriented architecture, they try to describe it as a highway system, which sort of works as a model, um, because in today's day and age, with sort of the Googles and Facebooks of the internet, we have commodity hardware. We scale out rather than scaling up. And sort of SOA fits very well with that because we're breaking down services into smaller chunks that require less resources, less computing power, and fit much better on the hardware stacks that we have. Also, SOA is really well easy to reason about failure with. So when you lose 1% of your hardware, you lose a rack it's much easier to understand what's going to happen rather than if you have a mainframe or something really large. Um, the other thing that happens with SOA is we make heavy use of the network. Instead of having one application that's all internal or one connection to a database and one to a caching, now you're possibly making many connections to different services to do different things. There are some drawbacks, of course, to this. Um, we've sort of hinted at them. but. If you've ever had to do a lot of console jockeying and you have some data and you want to process it, it doesn't always work out the way that you want. Sometimes there's edges or little cases that just cut, doesn't do exactly what you want um, or something like that. And this can lead to hacks. If you have services and they have their boundaries, they have the things that they do, and you want to add new functionality, it's sometimes hard to know where to put that. Similarly, and kind of obviously, network calls do incur overhead. So you can go hog wild and have you know, 50 different services, and you're like, great, I have my code is super easy to test. It's easy to monitor. It's easy to work with. Anybody can spin up and work on this. It's fantastic. But for, if you, for a request, you have to do 50 network calls to answer one user request. That may not work out. Finally, we talked a bit about complexity. And people will say that a service-oriented architecture just reduces complexity. And in a way, it does. But in a sense, it externalizes complexity. Because now, instead of having one application that you're deploying and maintaining, you have 20 applications. 20 things you have to monitor the versions of, you have to have a deployment cycle for, you have to have checks for, etc. So some examples from the industry. Presently, I work at Dropbox. We have like a file distributor. That's all it does. It just distributes files. Um, we also have a metadata service. Dropbox is one large file system, logically. And we have a service that just manages what goes where. It doesn't have to think about what's in the files. It doesn't think, have to think about ownership or things like that. It just manages locations, um, which makes it really easy to test and to ensure that all the edge cases are covered. If we go to open source, there's a million examples. In fact, most of the packages you think about can be thought of as services. Your, your proxy kind of packages like Nginx, Varnish, HAProxy, your uh, caches, memcache, Redis, et cetera, your databases, MySQL, Postgres, Cassandra, React, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are effectively services that you deploy. You, ideally, you want them to do one thing and do it well. You want your database to store data and to store it very efficiently. You don't want it to also double as some sort of offline processing framework or something like that. Probably. I mean, uh, maybe. So for today, we're going to define service as software that makes or receives requests, typically via an RPC layer, and usually over the network. This is pretty much everything. So it's not a very narrow definition. So why Go? Why would we consider using a new language from a couple of years ago? Go was built by Google four or five years ago by Rob Pike and a couple of folks over there. And 
it was built in an environment that is probably the largest purveyor of network services in the world. Google has a very large infrastructure. They have a very wide variety of things that they do. Um, and they you know, historically have used a lot of C, Java, Python, et cetera. So they have a pretty good idea of what it takes to build an efficient service. Go was designed not only in a modern era like that, but in an era where every computer has at least 16 cores, if you count hyperthreading. Um, every server in a data center probably has 64 plus. You talk about tens of gigabytes of RAM, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. Computers are a lot bigger than they were even 10 years ago. Back when I was working on LiveJournal and it was like, we had four gigs of RAM in our web servers and that was amazing, right? Now you have 10 times that, and, or 20 times that, and that's standard. Um, it was also designed in a world that is fairly modern as far as protocols go, as far as the best practices of how to communicate over the internet. JSON, REST, all of those things are fairly new in the grand scheme of things. They're less than 10 years old, um, by and large, and especially for wide-scale adoption. And Go was created after all of these things started to become true. So because of that, it supports them by default. It takes them into consideration. They're built into the language, into the standard libraries. They're not afterthoughts. Like, yes, anything that we talk about today, you can do in C, you can do in you know, Perl, Python, et cetera. Um, Go just has them built in as ahead of time. Also, slight bias. Um, I like compiled languages. I like statically typed languages um, and static compilation. It's also really fast. It's easy to learn. It's Unicode by default. So these days, most things we do have to support languages that are not just English. And Go has that built in, um, or at least very well designed for that. So it's just a pleasure to work with. So awesome. We're going to dive into the actual meat of the tutorial here. And today, we're going to be building a proxy. I happen to really love proxies. Um, but in specific, we'll be doing an HTTP proxy, which is a pretty, I think, probably safe to say most, uh, let me ask, how many people are familiar with the HTTP protocol at least a little bit? Great, fantastic. That makes the rest of this easier. Um, so we're going to build something that is fairly simple, but actually relatively performant. The, uh, the version of the code in there that we, we end up with um, can do thousands of queries per second on a single core. And uh, there's another version of the code I had in there that I hacked with that'll do almost like 8,500 per second, which is not too bad for a couple hundred lines of, a couple hundred lines of code. So why a proxy? And why is a proxy a good choice for a tutorial? I think everything can be solved with a proxy. And pretty much every company that I've worked at has deployed a proxy for one thing or another. Particularly if you don't control one end of a transaction, like if you're talking to a database and you want to do some analytics, but you don't want to write code in MySQL, um, you might deploy a proxy. Uh, Dropbox uses a MySQL proxy for statistics and other sorts of functionality. Um, HTTP proxies are great for uh, gathering statistics, changing behaviors, doing analysis, um, doing request redirection, you name it. Also, since we're talking about network services, a proxy is a good combination of client and server behavior, um, which is something we want to talk about and talk about both of. So we'll be doing that. So if we think about the basic design of a proxy and what's in it, there's, I, I don't even know, four basic phases. And you, how many people have actually have written network code um, to like a network server before in any other language? OK. Actually, that's great. So basically, the first phase is accepting connections, reading requests, proxying them to a back end, and then writing the response to the client. It's pretty straightforward. So now we're going to go into some actual code. So how this tutorial is designed to work, um, you should have a checkout of the code. If not, there, I have a USB stick with it. The code has a bunch of directories, part one, part two, part three, et cetera. If you want to follow along and write code, go into the part one directory, and you'll see a main.go. That's just a stub. If you just want to look at code and follow along visually and listen, go into the part one final directory, and you'll be able to look at the code that we will be writing. So your choice, depending on what you want to do, if you want to actually type it and compile it, then go for that. If you just want to hang out and listen and follow along, that's fantastic. 
and you'll go in the other directory. Is anybody not finding that? Or lost a question? I want to make sure you're all with me. Fantastic. So if you've ever done network listening for sockets in any other language, it looks exactly the same in Go. Right? And in fact, if you've ever written C um, or Java, there's a main function. Um, in other languages, they just start executing at the top. But in Go, there's a main function. So if you have your, your part one or your part one slash main dot go, we're going to start with the implementation on the if statement here. If you haven't seen if statements in Go, um, there's basically two halves to it. Or you can have two parts to your if statement, an initialization, and then the actual conditional. You can think about it like a for statement in C, where you have the initialization, the incrementer, and then the exit condition, or the stop condition. The if statements in Go can have an initialization and then the conditional. So in this case, we say we execute the first part, net.listen. We get back a listening socket and an error, and then we do the conditional check on error. We're throwing away errors at this point, or rather, we're checking to make sure we didn't get one, but we're just ignoring them. So we're not going to do anything fancy with errors yet. Um, then we're going into an infinite for loop, because with most network programming, you set up your listening socket, and then you accept connections over and over. I mean, the idea of the proxy is that it's just going to accept a connection, and it's going to do something with that. So this looks the same as in pretty much any other language. Um, all right, so this is what we're familiar with. But now we're going to talk about sort of HTTP and Go. And one of the reasons that it's really nice to write network support in Go is effectively the standard library. We're going to implement a complete HTTP proxy that'll do full end-to-end -end HTTP 1.1 in about 14 lines of code and never have to touch the protocol ourselves. Um, but one thing I will say is if you've done network implementation before, you've probably run into the situation where you write 10 bytes out to a socket, you write 10 bytes out, you write, you write a lot of small writes, and you go, wow, this is really slow, or this is using a lot of CPU usage. Um, so what you end up doing is buffered I.O., typically. You'll wrap your socket in a buffer system um, or a buffered I.O. abstraction, and then you'll write into that, and your bytes will go into a buffer. And eventually, you will then tell the buffer to flush. At that point, it will then write it out to the socket. The Go standard library for HTTP does not give you the option of doing things in the slow, terrible way. They force you to use the buffered I.O. library. Thankfully, uh, the buffered I.O. library is extremely easy to use because they know that this is a common pattern. And this is, we'll come back to this a couple of times with Go. They know the common patterns because we've implemented them for a couple of decades in other languages. So they just build them into the standard library. And in this case, they don't give you a choice about what to use. They force you to use buffered I.O. So great. At this point, if you've got your code up, you've probably got a couple of lines that listen on a socket or set up a listening socket and then actually accept a connection. Well, the next step, when we talked about those original four steps, is that we get a request. In the HTTP protocol, um, most of you put your hands up, but the first thing that happens is the browser connects to a server, the browser sends a request. So we're expecting now from, for a request to come in on this connection we just accepted. Since we don't, I don't want to have people pulling up all the docs right now and digging through them, I've cut and pasted the function definition from the HTTP library for read request. And if you read the docs, this says basically Given a reader, or buffered I.O. reader, it will read a request, an HTTP request, from that connection and return it. It's really, you know, in other languages, you can find modules that do this. Um, but in Go, it's just built into the standard library. So this is the code you already have. We're back in our code now. You've already got this line. This is your accept line. And then the next thing that happens is we have to create our buffered I.O. reader. When I said that it's basically one line in Go, this is it. You're using the buff I.O. module 
and calling new reader and giving it the socket that you're working with. And it returns a reader. And from now on, you can just do read calls on this reader, and it does behind the scenes buffered I.O. to make, your, make everything more efficient. Um, so that's great. The, now we have to actually read that request. If you see our function definition for read request, you just give it a reader, and it returns a request and an error. Go has multiple return values, which you might be familiar with from a couple of other languages. But this is the common idiom that we'll see time and time again, where a function returns the value and then possibly an error. Um, and then you always, do, you always check the errors. In our case, we're sort of not, but... So the next part, as mentioned, was read request. We have our buffered I.O. reader. We have to actually pull something out of it, or we want to pull a request out of it. And it's the same structure as all the other lines we're doing. We're, we're doing our initialization, request comma error, colon equals read request. And then we're checking to see if we did not get an error. How's the pacing? Are people able to follow on the time? Yes? OK. There's no head shakes, so we'll go. OK. So we talked about proxies. We talked about accepting a connection reading a request from it. And the next step is we have to send the request somewhere. So we have to talk to a backend. So we're using the net package to do this. And it's very simple. It's the same as we've been doing. You'll just see this is kind of over and over and over. We're doing net.dial. We're saying we want this to be a TCP connection. We want it to go to this port and, or this IP and port. And definitely do use, if you want to be testing what you're writing, do use this port. Um, this IP and port, because we'll be running a web server on this port here in a few minutes. And again, here we see our new buffered I.O. new reader. Well, the HTTP library requires you to use buffer, buff I.O., so we can go ahead and use that. Um, pretty straightforward. The next step we have to do is now that we've connected to a backend, we're going to send the request to that backend. We're going to say, OK, here you go. And then we're going to read the response back. We're going to pull this back from, or we're going to pull the response from, that, from the web server. So this, this again goes in, inside that if statement. If you notice a pattern here, we're just nesting 13 if statements, um, which is a terrible design, and we'll fix it. But it'll work for now. It'll suffice. So, one of the nice things here with the Go HTTP library is the request and response objects have a lot of methods to help you out here. And in this particular case, uh, the HTTP request object, req, has a write method where you can say, I just want you to write yourself out to this socket. You don't have to worry about the protocol. You don't have to think about you know, how to write out headers and how to write out body and how to deal with chunked encoding versus normal content length and close, right? You can just say, you know what, request, here's, here's a socket, write yourself out. The very astute will probably notice that we're not using buffered I.O. here for the writer. We're writing straight to the socket. This is pretty inefficient, so we'll fix it later, but I'm just noting it in case you've noticed. After we write the request to the back end, the next thing that happens is we get a response back, ideally, in theory. So we read the response. But we have to use the buffered I.O. reader here because the read, the read response method requires that. So fantastic. We've only got one step left to a fully functioning proxy. We've now gotten our, accepted a connection, gotten a request, connected to a back end, sent the request to the back end, read the response from the back end. Now we have to send the response to the client and then close everything out. So this is a little bit longer. Um, but you've already got the top and bottom line, the read response. And so all we're doing in the middle is another response.write like we just did for request.write. The, the response.close thing here since we're writing a serial proxy right now, we don't want to let one user tie it up. So we're 
telling the response that we want connection close. We, we don't want the client to think that they're going to be allowed to keep alive. So we set response.close. Then we write out the response to the client. And then we print something to standard out. We want to know, we want to be able to see that our proxy is actually working. So in this case, we're printing out the URL.path and the status code. But you could print content length or whatever the heck else you want to print here if you want. Um, finally, since we did response.close true, we have told the browser connection close that it can expect the connection to be closed. But then we actually have to close it ourselves. So con.close, this is the same in pretty much most languages that have object-oriented socket stuff. Um, so great. If you follow, follow it along with that, you should now have a, pro, a, a functioning HTTP proxy that the code looks terrible, and it's very slow, and it ignores errors, but it should work. Um, so let's, let's actually test this out. If you have, OK, if you're writing code and you have a working installation of the Go compiler, you should be able to go into that directory and type go build. And in theory, if I have, I have a terminal here. I have a terminal somewhere. Nah. Yep. We have a bunch of files here. Go build. Actually, I need to go into part one final. Go build. Oh, let's see. The code looks something like this now. Uh, that's horrible. <laughs> And if you build, you should end up with an executable that looks like part one final or part one. And if you execute that, it'll just sit there. Question? Any way to retrieve uh, dependencies? Because no build just uh, tells me no log buffio and uh, all the stuff. No log buffio or. Those are standard library dependencies. So that sounds like uh, you don't have your go root set or your go path. Um, Oh, well. So I have the package installed on my Mac. So if you run that, you can only run that if you've actually got the packages. Um, if you're using the actual source distribution that I have is what those scripts are for. So if you don't, if you're not using my distribution, then you probably do not want to run the shell scripts, the bash or fish scripts. So yeah, if you did run those, just open up a new terminal. Because those will set up the environment assuming that you're using the packages we have. Um, so did that work when you opened up a new terminal? Has anyone had success compiling? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Um, OK. So let's go back to this. So if you've had success compiling and running, yes, perfect, then you now have a proxy. But a proxy with no backend is not going to do any good. So we're going to have to build the backend. If you go up a directory, you'll probably need a new terminal. There's a web server directory. Just go build that and run it. You're welcome to look at the code if you want to make sure it's not doing anything dicey. Um, it's four lines of code, and it's a fully functional HTTP web server, because Go kind of has that built in. Um, once you run that, then you can test that your backend's working. Oops. I have to actually run mine. <laughs> Oops. Uh, if you do something like with curl to port 8081, you'll see that your web server is working. Um, and if that's working, 
then what you can do... Oh, that doesn't work. Is you can go to your browser... Maybe. And if you go to port 8080, oops, <laughs> remind me to actually run my code. You should actually see the Go documentation. Um, and then if you go back and look at your console, you should see that printf that you put into your code. Yes? Success? Perfect. So you now have a fully functional HTTP proxy um, in, I don't know, 14 lines of code. It's not very efficient, but it works. So let's make it better. Let's actually, let's actually do some stuff. All right, we already tested it. Um, is anyone having any problems before we proceed? Great. So now part two. That existing code was kind of lacking. If, you're, if you've done network stuff before, you'll realize this was very serial, uh, one customer at a time, and really slow. Although it's funny to call it slow. Um, 500 QPS, 10 years ago when I was working on proxies for LiveJournal, which were written in Perl, because we wrote a load balancer in Perl, uh, the day we got 400 QPS was an amazing day. So, we, yeah. So let's make it faster. Um, this is sort of where Go starts to really shine. Thinking about going faster in Go, or thinking about going faster in sort of any sort of programming, you start to think about things like doing things asynchronously or non-blocking, doing things in parallel, like forking, running things in multiple threads. There's a lot of ways you can make your program faster or you can do multiple things at the same time or at approximately the same time. Um, in Go, what we, tend to, what we do is concurrency. Uh, and it's, it's really it's built into the language. So what are we talking about when I say concurrency in Go? In essence, all the code you write in Go is blocking, by and large. All the code we just wrote is blocking. You say accept, and that blocks until there's a socket available for you to accept. You say write, and that blocks until the write completes. Um, same thing, read response, read request, etc. Those, those are blocking calls all the way down. So the logic in Go is basically that you c it has this functionality called um, Go routines, which allow you to effectively run blocking operations in multiple parallel Go routines, or concurrent, excuse me. Parallel is a bad word here. Um, and what happens is the runtime Whenever one of your Go routines blocks, the runtime can pick up on that and schedule a new Go routine. So uh, you can think of it like cooperative multitasking. If you go back in the day to back how multitasking used to work on computers, um, it's very similar to how it works in Go. Uh, if you dig into the details, the runtime can schedule new Go routines when syscalls happen and when you make function calls. So if you cross function boundaries, there's a chance that you'll get preempted and another Go routine gets scheduled. But these work together to effectively allow you to run many, many things concurrently. So how do we apply this to a proxy? Um, and how do you apply this to services in general? Typically, you think about breaking your project down um, into the sort of the units of work that you're doing and what kinds of work can be completed uh, concurrently. For a proxy, it's pretty straightforward. We're going to have clients. More than likely, or I mean with HTTP, if you exclude pipelining, a client is doing one thing at a time. They send you a request, you process it, you give them a response. But another client might also have sent you a request. And you could have hundreds of clients doing requests at the same time. It seems like this is a good candidate for Go routines for splitting up the work that our proxy is doing by the clients. The, uh, the, Somebody might come back and say, well, you know, and if you're used to doing it in a threaded model, the one thread per client connection works up to maybe a couple hundred, depending on your, your environment, before you start running into contention issues or resource issues. But in Go, you can have hundreds of thousands to millions of Go routines. The system is designed to run at that scale. Uh, it actually, 
I've never played with millions, but I've definitely played with hundreds of thousands, and it works pretty fine, pretty well. Um, so we're going to rewrite our proxy function to do this. So you have a choice here. You can either continue on with the code you've been writing, if you're happy with it, or you can switch over to the part two directory and start with a fresh copy, or you can go to part two final and follow along with this phase of the tutorial. Your choice, whatever you want to do. But we're going to start in our main function. And this is the same code that you already have, just rearranged slightly. We are adding error handling because I wanted to demonstrate sort of how you can do error handling here. Um, the, the traditional way of error handling in Go, you get your error, you do your command, and then you check if error is not nil, and you do something. In this case, we just exit the program because if we can't listen on the port, there's nothing we can literally do. So we might as well exit. Um, also, in writing this talk, I don't know how many windows I lost one of these running and had the port tied up and couldn't find it and pain in the ass. So we're going to start here. But now, what was the next step after accepting a connection? Well, the next step was we have to do something with that connection. In our case, we were going to read a request because we know there's going to be a request on that. But when we just talked about concurrency, we said we were going to add our concurrency at the client level, at the connection level. So that's probably about here. After we accept it, we want to do something concurrently. How do we do that in Go? If you've played with Go, you've probably seen the Go keyword. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say Go, handle connection, and pass it in the connection. The Go keyword is magical. What it tells the runtime to do is it says, take this function call, um, this, this bit of code, and go run that somewhere else. Go invoke that, like, just invoke it like you had just called handle connection, except invoke it in a separate Go routine. The main Go routine then just continues on. So from the perspective of main, it's like nothing happened here. From the perspective of handle connection, it got invoked from main, and it starts running. Um, main immediately loops back to accept and accepts another connection. So when another connection comes in, well, it spawns out a new Go routine. So first connection comes in, we spawn a Go routine. Second connection comes in, we spawn another, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what happens in handle connection? We've probably guessed we're going to take a lot of the code that we just had and move it into this new function. So in fact, you can start by just cutting, cutting and pasting all of the code you had inside the accept block into a new function. That's going to look like this. So again, this is mostly a lot of the same code you had. There's a new reader call. There's a read request call. But we're restructuring it for um, better, uh, better behavior. So let's walk through this and see what's actually happening here. First, we have this defer. Um, if you're fairly new to Go or haven't seen this, defer is really amazing. It's the idea, like, so let's think about, from our concurrent proxy perspective, we have a user. That user is going to be sending us requests. The part of our code that is talking to that user is this function. So logically speaking, if this function were to, to fail or die or, or crash or exit or whatever, if that Go routine goes away, we want to make the user go away because we don't want them to still have a connection open sending to the void. Go allows us to do this sort of thing by using defer. Defer says, I want you to run this code, this command, this function call, when my surrounding context, when my function exits, no matter how it exits. So in this case, there's a return call down here in an error case, and there's return calls later. If any of those get hit, or if our function panics, or you know, the equivalent of throwing an exception, somewhere down the, downstream, connection.close will get called. And we never have to, if you've written this kind of code, you've probably written this kind of code in other languages, you have to do, oh, if error case, con.close, return. And then later, if error case, con.close, return. And you have to remember to close the connection, et cetera. Go allows you to 
do it once, make it very clear that this will always be true, and then not worry about it in the future. The next part is we have our new reader. This is the same, same thing. We're just creating a buffered I.O. reader. This is new, though. We've added an infinite loop here. If you remember on the last one, we, we did a while true or a for, an empty for, around the accept, because we were just going to accept a connection over and over. But we were only processing one request per connection, because we weren't concurrent. Now we have one handler, one go routine per user, so we might as well leave the connection open and just read requests over and over and over. So we add this loop around read request. Um, this next bit is a little funky. We have to know when the user gets rid of the connection. When the browser closes the connection on us and goes away, we have to know that somehow so that we can exit. Otherwise, we leak resources, we leak memory and everything in the Go routine. So how we do that is now we're actually going to look at the error code that read request gives us. Because it can give us an EOF. It doesn't have a way of saying, or the way that it says that the connection has closed is read request returns nil, a nil request and an EOF, which is not strictly an error case, but it's how you can know that something, that it's done. All right. Anybody, everybody got the typed in? So now we're just going to cut and paste. This is the same exact code, no modifications, from part one. From the net dial, to the writing the request out, to the read response, to the response that write. We're not going to touch that yet. You can just put this in the middle of your block. Um, this goes down in the where the more code goes. So, um, and then we can just do this. All right. Give it a second, make sure people have got that, because we're about to compile again. So great, building part two. Same, same as before, uh, your directory might change depending on, like, I don't know where you're at in your file structure, but if you run go build, um, if you have continued on from the first part one, you might get a build error saying, oh, you've imported a module or something that we're not using, in which case you have to update your import line I think that's actually going to fire yet, but part three will definitely have that. Um, so let's see, once you get this built, you find my terminal again. The part two final. Part two, I'm running my web server somewhere, I think. Great, we have a response here. But now, the fun part's gonna be verifying that we're actually getting concurrent behavior. And if you know um, HTTP protocol, you can do something like get slash HTTP 1.1, enter, enter. And now, HTTP 1.1 defaults to keep alive. So in this case, this connection is still open. We could send it another request, and we'll get another one. So let's do that concurrently. Get slash HTTP 1.1. Get slash foo. Page not found. Where's my other? Get slash bar. So now we have two clients actually talking to our proxy. Um, and you can, you can do the same if you wish. But if you think about it, we, we went from building a single threaded single serving proxy in like 14 lines of code to building a completely concurrent proxy in 20-ish, right? And this is some of the power of Go. When you, if you were going to do the same in uh, something like Perl, you absolutely could. It, you would have to use a module, you'd have to pull in, you know, Poe or Danga socket or something else, you'd have to know how to use these, these modules, these specific way of implementing async IO or concurrency to do it. You know, in Python, you could use a threading module or Tornado or Twisted or whatever else. So I'm not arguing that Go can do things that other languages can't, just that it does them very easily and that they're built in. And, you know, if you're going to do a, a one-off easy network service, it's so easy. 
Did everybody get it compiled? Did it work? Yes. A couple thumbs up. People following? Fantastic. Any questions before we move on? Awesome. Um, let's go back to our slideshow here. So great. This new version is faster. Just by doing this, this little bit of concurrency, it goes up to about 2,000 queries per second. Turns out reestablishing all those connections to clients and everything is pretty slow. Um, so, oh, and this benchmarking, to give some background, I'm just using AB, Apache Bench, on the local machine. So it's not really a great benchmark, but it works. Um, and obviously, we're still not actually doing anything useful with our proxy. We're just proxying connections to a backend, which is great, but not, not really what we're trying to do. So let's actually gather statistics about requests. Um, this is going to be kind of a simple iteration of the idea, and you can extend it, or you can, you'll see how you can extend it, but in, to give you an idea. So let's think, what kind of statistics could we gather about a request? Well, there's like response codes, response sizes, there's timing information, like time to first byte, time to total response, you know, there's information on clients, there's a whole host of things you can get. Some of these you can get out of access logs. Um, obviously, request sizes are in access logs. Total time can be in access logs. Um, there's other things that don't show up in access logs um, that are much easier to get from a proxy. But for today, we're just going to do request size or response size more accurately. So you can either load up part three slash main dot go and get a pristine starting point. Or again, you can continue with where you're at if you're happy with your code. Um, or you can load part three final slash main dot go if you want to follow along with the code visually. I'm going to repeat that a couple of times. Hopefully that works for somebody. So this, we're back at the top of the program. So this is below the import section and above your main function. Um, we're going to define some global variables. Well, you know, it kind of makes sense that our proxy, all of the users are going to be doing things concurrently. But if we want to gather statistics, we probably want to have global statistics. I don't really care if user X had usage pattern Y. I want to see what the entirety of my website's doing, what all my traffic looks like. And the easiest way to kind of do that is to have global statistics. So in our case, we're creating a map from, uh, with the keys or strings and the values or integers. This is, in other languages, called dicts or hash or associative arrays. In Go, it's called a map. Um, and then we're going to create a mutex. We'll talk a bit more about mutexes, because if you've read like Effective Go or other things about Go, you might be wondering why we're using a mutex. Um, the next thing we have to do is we actually have to initialize our map. Uh, everything in Go is initialized to the zero value. For a map, for channels, for slices, the zero value is nil, which means you can't use them. So we actually have to create it. Um, and we have to use make, because it's an internal data type. The initialization function, I'll mention this. If you haven't seen it before, uh, init is like, uh, init is something that runs when the program starts. So you can think of it like main, except any module can have an init function, which is executed at the beginning of execution. There can only be one main function, because there's only one entry point to the program, but there can be a lot of init functions, and they all get executed. Um, I think it's a non-deterministic order, but don't quote me on that. So great. We're going to use, we have a global map, we have a mutex, we initialize our map so that we can use it. The next thing we have to think about is, okay, we have to put some data in this map. We have to actually gather statistics about what's happening in our proxy. So we're going to have a function that does that. So you can add a new function, above main or below main, doesn't really matter. And I called it update stats, you can call it whatever you want. It takes a pointer to an HTTP request object and a pointer to a response object. Because from our perspective, this happens when the proxy is finished, when, or when it has gotten the response back from the back end. We want to collect some data about that transaction and save it to our map, and then move on with sending the request to the user. So you've seen this pattern before with the defer. We have a mutex, so we're going to lock it, and then we're going to defer and unlock. And this is a really useful pattern if you're dealing with locks, because it's really annoying to diagnose locks that are held and never get unlocked. You lead to deadlocks and problems. 
But if you defer it here, it doesn't matter how this function exits. It could crash and panic. That mutex will still get unlocked. So from a, a best practice perspective, if you're ever dealing with mutexes or locks, the deferred unlock is really kind of the way to go. You'll save a lot of trouble. The rest of this is really straightforward. Um, we're getting the current value of request bytes for a path, adding in the current content length, putting it back in the map, and returning it. Um, unlike in Python, if you reference into a map on a key that does not exist, you get back the zero value. So if you, in this case, we have integers as our values, we get back zero. If you have strings, you get back an empty string. If you have you know, channels or something else as your value in your map, you get back nil. So you don't have to check and see if a key exists before you update the map. Question? I may be getting ahead here. Cool. Um, I may be getting ahead here or um, overthinking it, but would this process of updating stats be better as a separate go routine with a channel? Great question. Um, so let's talk about mutexes and go. <laughs> so only slightly ahead. Um, it's, I was hoping somebody would ask that because it's, it's really a great thing to talk about. Um, this is one of like, if you go read a lot of the blog posts, people are like, go has channels, channels are thread safe, you don't have to deal with locking, you don't have to deal with all this stuff. Use channels, 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 channels. That's great. Um, I really want to, I want to write Go in a very Go way. And channels are very Go. Um, and in fact, if you read a lot of the blog posts by Rob Pike, et cetera, they say, don't, they say share memory by communicating. Don't communicate by sharing memory. And clearly in this case, we're communicating by sharing memory. Um, channels have things that they are really good at. Channels are really good for cross-thread coordination. If you have a worker queue and you have a bunch of workers, using channels to distribute work to them is a fantastic application of channels. You don't have to deal with locking. You don't have to deal with sort of like contention on that channel. Go does all of that for you in the runtime. Um, it's also great for, like, as mentioned, passing ownership. If you have something that you want to give to somebody else, passing through a channel works really well for that. Um, Mutexes are, well, if you've done other engineering, you've dealt with mutexes. They're, they're good for locking things. When it comes down to it, use whatever's simplest. We're all trying to write software here, and especially if you're trying to write production quality software where other people are going to have to work on it and use it. The goal, in my mind, is not to use whatever's cool in the language. Um, that would totally get the job done. You're right. We could have a Go routine listens on a channel, we could send stats requests down that channel and have that own the data structure. And that would probably work fine. Um, but in this particular case, I think, oh, we have an update function. It updates a data structure. There's only one person touching that. A mutex is, for me, felt a little simpler for this implementation. Um, channels are often the best way to do things, like a lot of the things I mentioned. But it's kind of six and one half a dozen of another. If you find yourself using locks and using locks in a dozen places, and then you have locks to protect your locks, then you have a, a read-write lock here and a mutex here, and then you're debugging race conditions and things like that, you're probably doing go wrong, right? Um, on the other hand, if you're like, well, I could totally use a channel here, and you know, but it's not necessary, you don't have to, right? So find what's simple, find what is expressive for your problem. Um, does that answer? Cool. I'm, you know, I'm not a, uh, uh, what's the word, zealot when it comes to languages. Like, I use whatever gets the job done so I can move on to the next thing. Um, so I happen to like Go, but I'll do whatever I need to do to, to get it done. So, right. Let's go back to our code. This is the response in the right line you already have. So we've already got these two bits of the code. We're just adding a call to our update stats here. So this is, I mean, we have to get the response back from the back end before we can actually update our statistics, because so we, we have to know how big the response is before we can put that into our structure. 
So we call update stats, we get the current bytes, and in this case, one of the things that you do in proxies is you modify the data. You modify your request or your response. Um, and don't be evil. In our case, we're going to modify the response and add a header here that says how many bytes have been requested on this path, or how many bytes have been returned on this path. So pretty straightforward. Um, all right. Give a second for anybody who's got typing that, because we're about to test it. All right. So now, oh, connection closed because I've been sitting here idle. Oh, and there's the error handling we added a while ago for failed to read request, malformed request. So now we build part three. And that's running. And now let's go back to our curl. And if we run curl against it, you'll see here's our header that we added, showing that our, our stats is working. If we do it again, 14K, we do it again, again, and again. Um, we could do something like this and do a whole bunch of requests. Let's cancel that, run it again, and now it's done 77 megabytes of slash. So if we give it a different URI, So looks like our data structure is working. We're collecting statistics around our global, around paths and how big the responses are. I mean, obviously you could do anything here um, and probably not publish the stats back to your users, but you could. Uh, we actually did this in our load balancer for LiveJournal. We would put a header in there that was like basically how long you had to wait for a backend and how many other people were waiting in line as well. Back when people used to complain about how slow the site was. So people wrote plugins for their browser that would pop it up and be like, you waited four seconds for that page to load. It was not really a great, great thing, but it was fun. Um, all right, so we have our testing here. All right, let's get a little more wild with our proxy. Obviously, at this point, for every request, we're still establishing a connection to a backend. That's inefficient. So let's look at connection pooling, which is a pretty commonly used thing in services. Um, because what we, what we don't want to do is create a connection for every user. Because we don't want to have, like if we have 100,000 users connecting to our website and they have long-lived connections, we don't necessarily want to have 100,000 connections to our backend, right, that are just sitting there idle most of the time. It's not an efficient use of resources. We probably want to have a pool of backends, have our connections to, the, to clients, and then whenever they send us a request, get a connection from our pool, use it, and then put the connection back in the pool. Sort of the most efficient way of doing this kind of thing. I mentioned the ephemeral port issue. Um, has anybody actually run into problems with ephemeral port exhaustion in the past? Great. If you're ever benchmarking something and it goes really fast for about 10,000 requests or 20,000 requests, and then it stops. And 60 seconds later, it goes really fast for another 20,000, and then it stops you're probably running into ephemeral port exhaustion. Um, if you want more info, you can Google it. It's fun and interesting when it happens in development, less so when it happens in prod. Um, so how are we going to build a connection pool? Well, if you think about the, the algorithm I just described, it's basically a queue. You have backends, you put them in a queue. When a client needs a backend, it pulls it from the queue, uses it, and it puts it back in the queue. So we're going to look at doing queues in Go, which means we're going to get into channels. So we're also going to take, take time here to, we've been building these buffered IO readers and writers and using those, which means we're dealing with a connection, a socket object, a buffered IO reader object, and a buffered IO writer object. I don't really want to be passing all three of these around all over the place. So we're going to create a structure to put them in. And that's our top part here. Um, oh, and since I didn't read it out loud, if you want to follow along, we're in part four. You can open part four slash main.go if you want to type code, or part four final if you want to read code. So we start with our structure here, and we're using an embedded type. Has anybody played with embedded types in Go? One hand? Two hands? Great. So 
I'll go through an explanation of it. Um, I'm going to assume you've done object-oriented programming in other languages. Yes? Some heads? Perfect. If you subclass, if you have a foo object, and you subclass it with a bar object, and foo has a method on it, a method to close, and then you call bar.close, it ends up calling foo.close if bar doesn't have one. Right? It's this idea of methods basically get inherited by the subclasses. Go does not have subclassing or object-oriented programming in that sense. Um, Go has types and interfaces and methods and things. Uh, but one thing that Go has is what's called embedding or type embedding. And what you can do is when you define a structure or when you define an interface, you can put an anonymous type at the beginning. So in this case, you notice in our structure, the bottom two, the reader and the writer, there's a field, uh, a member name reader, and then a member type, and a member name writer, and a member type. But the top one, net.con, does not have a member name. It just has a type. What we're basically telling Go is, hey, we're going to create this backend structure. Basically, it's a wrapper around this other type called net.con, um, or it's an embedded type. And it effectively lets you, when we create a backend in a little bit and use it, um, we can call methods on that backend, which will then get called on the net.con. So it's a, it's a way of simplifying your, your methods, and it's a way of allowing us to pass backends to things that expect net.cons. So it's sort of a subclass. Um, so we're going to embed a net.con, and we're going to add a reader and a writer. And then we're going to add a backend queue channel. Channels are pretty awesome in Go. We're going to make use of it for our queue here. We're going to say that this is a channel of pointer to backend structs. We have to update our initialization function, because as with maps, you have to initialize channels, or you have to make them. So we make this here because it's a global channel. Everybody can use it. And we're going to set it to a size of 10. Um, in essence, what we're doing here, when you create a channel, you have two options. You can create an unbuffered channel or a buffered channel. And to sort of, the way to think about this, or the way that I think about this, is if I'm going to give you something, if I wanted to hand you this remote, you have to take it from me, right? Like, that's an un that is an unbuffered channel, in the sense that if I want to hand this to you, until you are ready to take it, I have to wait. I'm going to be blocked. If I say I'm giving this or I'm putting this into a channel, I'm blocked until the other person is ready to take from the channel. There's no buffer. A buffered channel is more like a mailbox. If he has a mailbox, I could go put this in the mailbox, and I know he'll be able to get it later, and then I can go about my business. But as with any mailbox, there's a size limit. You can define how big of a buffer you want for your channel. Once that buffer is full, once your mailbox is full, you can no longer put things in it, and then you block. So in this case, we're creating a backend queue of size 10, so which means it can hold 10 backends before it starts to block. Now we're going to get a little hairy with the code, because if you think about how this queue is going to work, we basically have two operations we want to do. We want to manufacture backends, or put backends in the queue, and we want to take backends, or, or rather, yeah, we want to get a backend from a queue, and we want to put a backend into the queue when we're done with it. So how do we, let's, let's think about getting a backend from the queue. Um, logically, there's two things that we are going to do, or two paths. Either there's a backend in the queue already, and we'll just use that, or there's not, and we'll make one. Right now, we're just making backends all the time. So you're going to see some of that code. So I like small functions. I like moving behavior into small little units that are easier to think about. So in this case, we're going to have a get backend function. And it returns, like any good Go function, a value and an error. This is, this is a kind of a mess of code, or, or kind of an interesting, more complicated bit of code. So let's, let's break it down into our two cases here. In Go, 
you've probably seen select statements before in other languages, where you do select case of this, case of that, case of that. And you know, it, it goes top to bottom until one of the cases is true, and then it runs that case. Um, same idea in Go. When you say select, you give it a bunch of cases, and it blocks until one of those cases is true. And that's, that's the, the part to remember. Um, in this case, we have no default. So Go will block here until one of these cases is possible. Since the top, let's look at the top one. This is the syntax for reading from a channel. We have our backend queue channel. We want to possibly pull data out of it. So we say case backend reads from backend queue. If you read from a channel that has nothing in it, you block. So if there's an empty channel and you say read, you block. So in the ideal case, when we call get backend, this fires, there's a backend in the queue, we return it, we move on, we're done. And it exits. It returns backend common ill because there was no error. Now let's, in the other case, let's say there's no backend in the queue. Well, we could just immediately create a backend, which is what we have them doing. And that would be fine, but I wanted to demonstrate a, a common paradigm. Um, in this case, it costs us resources to create a backend. It's a new connection, it takes time to set it up, you have to do the, the TSB handshake, um, and you're not gonna be sure if there's a web server on the other side yet, or if you're just talking to Linux, which has optimistically accepted you and put you in the listen queue, right? So there's a slight penalty to creating a new backend. We know that, and so we're gonna say, you know what, we're willing to wait a little bit to see if a backend becomes available, to see if somebody else finishes with one and puts it back in the queue. So what we do here is the time module has an after function, which basically creates a channel. And in that channel, it sleeps for however long you give it, and then it writes out a value. So what we do here is by having these two cases, if there is a backend in the queue, the first case fires immediately, we return it. If there's no backend in the queue, the timer starts for 100 milliseconds. In that 100 milliseconds, if a backend becomes available in the queue, the first case still fires. Because Go will pick the first case that becomes possible. But if 100 milliseconds goes by, the timer fires, and the second case becomes possible. And at that point, we create a new backend. This is the net dial code you've already seen. We cr connect to the backend, and if it was successful, then we return a backend structure. And this is how we create our backend structure. We create the new buffered IO reader and the new buffered IO writer, and we return that. We don't put it into the queue or anything because we know somebody wants to use it. So that's great. Any questions about this construction? Back. Sorry, I was just asking if you could go through that one more time. Yeah, yeah totally. So you come into the select, mm -hmm. and the back end is not available. You kick off the timer, and you're waiting. And at some point, before the timer expires, uh, are you saying Go comes back into the top of select? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. so select is not, um, in other languages, select is, runs top to bottom, case, 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 case. Go is concurrent or parallel, if you want to think about it. It does evaluate them from, well, I think it actually evaluates them in random order, uh, technically. But it evaluates all of them repeatedly until one of them becomes true. If you have a default, like you can have a default section, and if you have that, then if all of them are false, then it fires default immediately. So like another way you could have, the original implementation here had case, the first case and then had a default. And the default was to create a new backend. Um, but in this particular case, that's less efficient than waiting a little bit of time for a backend. So yeah. Uh, the other edge case is if multiple are true, like if, you have, if you're reading from three different channels, all three of them are viable, Go will pick one randomly. So it's defined random. Does that make sense? Perfect. Okay. So this is getting a backend from a queue. Uh, 
the other part that I mentioned was putting a backend into the queue. And you might think, oh, we just put it back into the channel and we're good. But there's actually two cases there as well. They're much simpler. So queue backend takes a backend and it doesn't return anything because it's never going to fail, ideally. And option one, put the backend in the queue. And in that case, well, there's nothing else to do, so we're done. But option two is, like, let's imagine we're in a situation where 100 people hit the website at the same time. Well, we don't have 100 backends available, so we create 100 backends. Now those users go away, they're done. Well, we have 100 backends, but our queue is only 10 long. So we can't put 100 backends in the queue. And we don't want to, actually. We, we want to allow them to die off. So we use the same sort of timer trick here where we say, OK, I'm willing to hold on to this backend for a period of time, in this case, one second. And if in that one second the queue empties out or becomes available, we'll put our backend in the queue and we're done. If a second goes by and that hasn't happened, then we close the backend and move on. So how do we use this code? The top bit is your existing code, your net.dial, new reader, write, read response. And this is the new code with, with better error handling. We call get backend. It returns something to us. And then we say we use that backend, be.writer. And remember how earlier I said, oh, we were writing directly to the connection and not to the buffer IO because we hadn't created one? We've now created one for writing, so we're going to use it. The caveat or the trick to using buffered IO writers is that you always have to flush. If you don't remember to call flush, there's going to be some trailer of bytes sitting in the buffer forever, and you're going to wonder why your proxy doesn't work anymore, because you're only getting half a page. That probably means you forgot to flush. So the final bit is we're going to re-queue the backend, put that back in the queue. Now note here, we spin this off in a Go routine. Remember, we're in the middle of our handle connection here. We are handling requests from the user. We don't really want to block that thread holding on to a backend. Uh, thread's the wrong term. We don't want to block that Go routine holding on to a backend that we may or may not be able to put into the queue. Because if the queue's full, then we're going to block for a second. So spin it off in a Go routine. There's no return value you care about. You just want this thing to happen asynchronously at some point in the future. Let that go deal with itself. And this is a pretty common paradigm or pattern you'll see in Go code when you have something you want to get done, but you don't need to care about when it happens. You can just spin it off in a Go routine. If you do care and you don't want to block, you can still spin it off in a Go routine, but you can give it a channel, and then you can go look at that channel later for results. Um, so, great. Now we can play with uh, part four here. It's not really, there's nothing really to demonstrate with this one. There's no visual output. Um, ugh, I can't type if I'm not looking at my keyboard. Whoops. Oh, there, I was about to go run it in the wrong window again. Uh, I mean, it's running. It still has our bytes here. So it's functioning. Um, if you want to play with it, you can add some print debugging, and then it will tell you what it's doing. So great. Now what else? So now we have a proxy that has concurrent incoming connections. It can handle tens of thousands of parallel connections at the same time. It has a connection pool on the back end, so it makes efficient use of resources to talk to servers. Um, it collects some global statistics on requests. What else can we do? Um, there's still one place that needs a buff IO. The writing the response back to the user needs that, and you can play with that if you want. Um, I will say in benchmarking, it's roughly a 2x improvement by fixing that, because the uh, HTTP library writes out in a very bad, it makes many calls to write, like 20 calls for a header. It's pretty bad. So you definitely want to use buffered IO. There's also a problem, like if you think about our connection pool, we put connections into it and we never 
get rid of them unless we have traffic. So if you have a low traffic website, you're going to end up with old connections that just sit there and get they expire. And then you're going to time out, or then you're going to have some bad responses to users because they get a bad backend. There's also an optimization you can do by keeping the queue warm, like by saying, "Oh, my backend queue is empty. I'm going to put in some backends." You can. That's a pretty easy thing to do in a Go routine. You just have a Go routine that just checks to see if the queue is empty and spins up some backends. Um, you could add a lot more statistics and things. And the current structure is 150 lines of just Go in a file, which is fine, but not great. Um, when I started writing this talk, I wrote an initial version of this um, that I had to pare down quite a bit to present. If you look in the final directory, you'll see an implementation that may or may not be any good, um, but is fun. And that makes a lot more use of, that does backend pre-warming, that does backend expiration, that does a lot of the things that I just talked about that I don't go over in the talk. So we're going to slightly switch gears a little bit. Um, before we do that, any questions so far? Great. We're going to talk about RPCs. Um, I was planning this for an hour 30, and then I found out I had an hour 40, so we're not exactly low on time yet. But uh, we'll look at how you do, how you can do RPCs in Go. Um, it actually has a whole built-in functionality for adding RPC clients and servers to your application really easily. So for fun, we can add that to our proxy. Um, this is in the part five directory. There's a main.go and a part five final, as per usual. So when you think of RPC, there's obviously two sides. There's a server and a client, right? There's the, the side that is going to be receiving requests and answering them. And there's going to be a side that makes requests. We've already done a lot of that with our proxy, but we've been managing it manually ourselves. We listened on a port. We accepted a connection. We read a request. We dealt with it ourselves. Now we're going to leverage some of Go's functionality for doing RPCs so we don't have to really deal with it. So there's two parts to that. This is a mess of code here, but I'll walk through it. In essence, the RPC system in Go works by defining functions that have an explicit, specific method interface. And by that, I mean, if we look at our get stats here, if you want to use RPCs in Go, the built-in RPC library, you have to define a function on a pointer to something, in this case, RPC server, and it has to take two arguments. The first one is the input arguments. The second one is a pointer, which will be the output arguments, and it has to return an error. Um, so that's the signature. And for this case, we're going to implement a method that returns our request bytes global structure. Because we want somebody to be able to connect to us and say, hey, give me your stats. Like, give me all of the stats. Because I don't want to just look at the stats on this particular page. I want to see everything. We don't take any arguments. So we define an empty struct, because you have to have something. Um, and our return value is going to be this stats struct, which has request bytes, which is that is the same map signature of our global map. We then define our RPC server type. Um, Go does a lot of things based on type names. So in this case, it's an empty struct, but it's just a way of collecting behavior on a name. If you think back to, if you're familiar with Python, this is just doing you know, class RPC server object pass. It's an empty thing with like no behavior, really. Um, empty structs are useful in that way. We then have our get stats function, which is on RPC server, takes no arguments, and it replies with a stats structure. We have to deal with a lock. This is our mutex. Like we don't want to fight with updating of the request object. So again, we take the mutex, we defer the unlock, um, and then we copy it. This is a very simple, we make the map in our reply, and we copy all the data in. Um, and then we return nil, because there's no error. So this is how you define, like, if we, we could then create new functions, a so func RPC server, do something, arg reply error, and it will become exposed in the RPC system. The second half that you have to do is you have to actually initialize the server. 
So if we went back to our main function, you would say like RPC register RPC server, because that's the, the name of the thing that has the behavior on it. That's the empty struct that we defined. And then we say RPC handle HTTP, which means there's a couple different protocols that the RPC server can use. In this case, we're telling it to use HTTP. And then this is the same listen as anything else. You establish your listening socket on whatever port, and then you run a Go routine that says HTTP serve on this listening socket. In our case, we're not running this on the same port as our proxy. You could. Um, you'd have to do some path separation to make sure that like, the proxy doesn't try to serve the RPC paths. Um, but in this case, I'm just doing it separately. That's it. That's all you have to do on the server side. If you implement this in, in your proxy, you have a fully functional RPC layer that will return the statistics object. On the client side, it's this. That's it. Right? You, well, you have to have the same types. So the empty struct and the stat struct that we defined in the main class, we also have here. But then you dial HTTP to, this, to the endpoint, and you call. And Go handles all of the marshalling. It handles all of the sort of discovery of figuring out, oh, this is a, a map that we're passing back and forth. How do I put that over the wire efficiently? How do I discover what methods are available in the remote end? Go just does that for you. Right? You don't have to um, have really long definitions of functionality um, that you might have to have in other languages. It's pretty straightforward. And if we were to show this, this one's actually demoable. And if you have it, you can play with it. Part 5. Whoops. I think it's just called Part 5. So now we have a server. Part 5. Client. Now we have a client. I think if I run this, nothing happens because there's no data yet. Index out of range. That's great. So now, like, we'll run some data against it. Oh, um, uh, ah, damn it! It's another way I've been testing this by running wget mirror against it. There we go. Stuff's happening. Ah, now if we run our client here, it's making an RPC call to the proxy, which is actively doing stuff, although I think it finished. So you can see stuff's happening, and it's returning the data. I'm like, hooray. Um, not a lot of code, easy to do. All right. We covered a lot of ground today. We have built a fully functional HTTP proxy um, with an RPC layer that you could take this and you could actually, right, unless you're a super large website that gets you know, tens of thousands of queries per second, you could actually deploy this code and start gathering statistics on your requests if you wanted to. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that without some more battle testing, um, but it's fun. So great, I'm a proponent of Go, I think it's fantastic, but there are some gotchas if you're going to use this in heavy production. Go is still new as a language, it's only a couple years old. And if you read the mailing lists, you'll probably see the flame wars where people are like, Go needs generics, Go needs exceptions, you know, Go needs you know, whatever else that it doesn't have right now. They're being slow and methodical about the language design. They don't want to just add a lot of functionality until it's really clear what's needed and why it's needed. So you know, if you're someone who really needs those things it doesn't have, you might have to wait a while. Also, best practices, our industry as a whole is very new. Right? This whole internet thing is newfangled. We're still figuring out which end is up and how to deal with it. Right? Every week there's a new fascinating, uh, oh, if you read all the openness to cell vulnerabilities and things, like we're still learning how to write code and how to test it. And when it comes to language, like Go, we're still learning the best practices. So adoption of Go at this point, like, I recommend it. Dropbox is, at this point, every request you make to Dropbox goes through at least one or two layers of Go. Our primary data storage engine is MySQL, but we have a uh, data storage layer on top of MySQL um, to handle things like multi-region and, and failover and et cetera. Uh, that is written in Go. 
that's called Edge Store. There's talks available. And we trust it. Right? We run our high production services through it. It works pretty well. Has some gotchas. One of them is garbage collection. Um, if you've never really had, like, I don't know, GC has never really bit me much in, in Perl or Python. Um, but in Go, I've run into it a couple of times when you're starting to do thousands and thousands of QPS. Those 10 allocations you do per query start to add up. And when you start to get 20 millisecond, 50 millisecond GC pauses, right, those start to become noticeable in your graphs. There's a lot of t tips you can use for dealing with that. Right? You can keep your allocations in check. You can use free pools, et cetera. If you've done any Java in the past, right, you probably have a whole world of tricks that you can use. Um, libraries. The standard libraries are pretty good. We just implemented a full HTTP proxy and RPC server in you know, 150 lines of code. I mean, the HTTP proxy in like 15 lines of code. You can do some really powerful things with the libraries. Um, on the other hand, they are just a couple of years old, so you will find some interesting edge cases. Uh, if you dig around in the proxy, you'll find out that it doesn't really speak HTTP 1.0 very well, which caused some problems for Apache Bench because it only speaks 1.0. So, I mean, arguably you don't really need 1.0 too much these days, but something to think about. Third part of your library is, well, you win some, you lose some. Um, a lot of people got really excited about Go, wrote some libraries, and then they went off to other things, and their libraries are unmaintained. So you have to be a little bit picky about the libraries you pick. Uh, if, you, if you look at, Dropbox has released a lot of our internal libraries, and we have like a Net2 and a HTTP2 and some other things because we found the core libraries were missing like thread pooling or connection pooling and stuff that we wanted, so we implemented that on top. Um, but definitely look for things that are updated, that people are using in production. Um, there's a couple of companies out there releasing good stuff. Also, this tends to bite everybody at one point or another. By default, Go only runs effectively in one thread. Uh, it, that's a simplification. So if you think, oh, this, this language, I can spin up my Go routines and it's going to saturate all 16 cores, that's fantastic. You won't see that by default. You have to tell Go, go ahead, you're allowed to use up to 16 processors. And so you can do that, but of course there are some you should benchmark. If you're doing something that actually is going to try to push 16 cores and you're making heavy use of channels, right, you're probably going to see some uh, inflection points in performance where it works really well with four cores, it works okay with eight, falls off a cliff at 12, or something like that. The overhead of communication as you increase the number of things that have to communicate gets to be pretty heavy. So in short, best practices from C and Java, etc., are mostly the same, actually. How do you design your memory usage? How do you think about allocations? And how do you think about sort of mutexes and things like that? Like, just because we have a new fancy language doesn't mean the best practices for writing code have changed. So people sometimes come to Go saying it's going to solve all these problems, and I don't have to think about that anymore. And in some cases, that's true. But in other cases, it doesn't work that way. Um, Go doesn't mean you can just forget about everything forever. If you come from Perl or Python or Ruby, you will instantly find that the code that you write takes maybe 1.2 times as long to write, and it runs 10 times faster. Like, it just, out of the box, a compiled Go program on average is 10 times faster than an equivalent interpreted language program. Um, so maybe you never have to worry about how fast your stuff is. But you might. So um, thank you. I, I love Go. I hope you will go actually go out and write some. And we have a few minutes for questions, but otherwise you can find me online. Um, here, there's also a lot of good things to go find other talks, documentation, uh, the slides are on, GitHub, and everything else. So questions. Could I, um, just a sort of general question about um, Go and I, in my, in my particular interest is in multiprocessing mm -hmm. and distributed processing. Um, it, it would be lovely to sort of treat distributed processing as a kind of just another Go routine that you could just say, just, you know, by the way, Go compiler, use these other 16 machines and run stuff on them as well. Right. But uh, I'm not expecting that. Is there any sort of reasonable uh, facility to make that easy in Go at the moment? Sort of. So I'm trying to remember the name of the library. 
Um, I assume everybody could hear the question. Channels can run over networks, yes. Um, well, there is a fantastic library that actually basically allows you to extend the channel functionality across network. Um, do you? Libchan? Libchan? Yeah, it's Libchan. Maybe, uh, that might be it. Um, but yes, some people have done that and implemented that. And then at that point, you can build your, your one little program and still use the same functionality and channels and everything, but it runs across a bunch of others. So I haven't had need to play with it. I don't know too much about it. Um, yeah, it'd be, but definitely look up Libchan, some of the stuff I, Docker's been doing. So, but yeah, de definitely people have been going in that direction. So, yep. Oh, I had a question. Um, you collect your own statistics. Is that a comment on XBAR? Is that a comment com on, on XBAR, the built in um, package for exposing variables? You've done your own strut and mutex locking. Oh. Uh, is that because you don't like XBAR? You no, know, I don't think I've played with it too much. I, oh. I think for the, for the demo case, um, you know, I will have to look into it. So XBAR does then basically exactly what you've done and adds a web handler. Ah, OK. Nice. So there are a lot of things in Go. Like, do you know when that was actually created? That might be in the past year or two. Oh, really? Ah, OK. Well, I'll look into it. More questions? Thank you all for waiting for the microphone. Um, I've heard that um, the garbage collection stuff is going to be fixed in 1.5. Do yes. you know anything about that? Yeah, so people, I, I mean, it's been a common complaint about the performance of the GC and whether or not it's, uh, whether the perfect, right? Whether it could detect cycles and break them and everything. Um, they've been making a lot of progress with it, and yes, they're going to improve it a lot in 1.5. I don't know if it's going to be, I mean, I don't know if it's going to solve all the problems, right? It's a really hard problem. You know, even Java, which has been around for a while, hasn't solved it, right? It's, so I think we have a ways to go. But um, I don't know a lot of the details about what they're improving. I think like cycle counting and um, that sort of thing are better. Question. Uh, in your running at Docker, or in your experience at Docker, are you finding any problems with the static compiledness? Or at Dropbox? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dropbox. Sorry. I was like, sorry. Brain dead. <laughs> um, so the only problem we've had with the static compilation is that one, we were upgrading from 1004 to 1204 machines. We ran into some issues where if we compiled it on 1204, it would use like libc versions that didn't run on 1004. And then when we try to distribute it to 1004, it wouldn't work anymore. Because the, the libc is actually still dynamically linked. It's not statically compiled in. So that's one gotcha. Like everything else is statically compiled in, but not the libc. So you have to think about that. And that does mean like if you do run on machines with like vulnerable versions of libc, like you should upgrade them. Um, other than that though, uh, we have had pretty good luck with having like a build machine and just tightly controlling what is on that machine. And then when we push it out, we can make sure that then we know what is actually running, what version of everything is running. So like, which has been pretty good for us. So. So within the Go community, there's obviously been this explosion of people writing their own versions of different things. Um, and one of those that the new people find out very quickly is there's a million and one different frameworks for writing REST APIs. So given that I'm assuming Dropbox uses REST APIs, what would you recommend to people as something that is reasonably good and worth trusting? We don't actually use any, well, all of our APIs are pretty much protobuf, right? So internally, we built an RPC layer on protobufs and so that it's compatible with our Python, our C, our everything else, um, and it's efficient over the wire. So like at our scale, uh, we don't really deal with REST or JSON-based APIs. Like we have, um, it's kind of, we don't use the internal RPC library because we actually tied it in with sort of our metric system um, so that we can tag RPCs with sort of like where they came from and where they're going and how long they're taking and everything and put that data into an Elasticsearch database so we can do analysis on it. So in that sense, like we're not using the, the Go RPC libraries or any of the, the JSON or REST APIs. 
Um, the one place we are using a REST-ish API, we're just serving using the net built-in HTTP and the net slash, I think it's net slash JSON RPC module. So, any other questions in the back? I see in your uh, Go Dropbox uh, GitHub repo, there's lots of two versions yep. in there. How do you see the adoption of that stuff going into, say, the main line? Do, is there a path there? Yeah, a lot of that stuff, like, we're not really pushing the standard library to adopt it because some of it is kind of special case to our needs. Um, but some of them is like our sort two module, it has like a uint six slice, a uint 16 sort slice, and a uint, like, all those ones. Like, the standard sort package only has like string slice and int slice and like one other. But if you want to sort int 32s, you have to define it. So like we just defined a bunch of those. Um, I, that's one of the things where like I think they don't want to take it upstream because like there's the argument about generics and maybe they're going to make generics and then have sort just work on that instead of uploading like 45 different type slices for sorting. Um, some of the other ones like we're we're not really fixing bugs in the standard libraries. Those get fixed pretty quickly. It's more like we're adding some functionality that integrates better with sort of our internal tooling or stuff that, like we have a memcache client in there and they're not going to upstream a memcache client. So, but. Anything else? Anyone cool. have any questions? All right then, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark Smith. And this is a thank you all gift for, for you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>